This world doesn't have anything for me. How about you? Thanks, God. Give these guys another praise the Lord offering. Amen. Good to see you today. Beautiful weather outside. Just love days like today. Amen. Open your Bibles with me to Philippians chapter 4 as we continue in our series of messages in the book of Philippians called Extraordinary Living. So we've gone through these chapters 1, 2, 3, and now beginning chapter 4, we're seeing some very unique things that come out. One, many people talk about this being the book of joy, the book of rejoicing. It certainly is. But we've discovered there are certain things that really need to be a part of your life if you're going to understand that and understand what that means. And even more so, if you're going to experience the joy the Lord has for you in your life. In chapter one, we started with that, having that single mind, you know, that our minds are, are not set on things below, or our, our, our goals, our motives, all pressing towards Jesus Christ for the, the prize of the high calling of Christ Jesus. In chapter two, remember, we dealt with having that submissive heart, submissive mind, a mind that's, that is set on honoring God with your life and ministering and serving others as well and putting others before yourself. And there's so much joy that's going to come in your life as a result of those two elements. The third part we talked about was that mind that is set on the things of God where, where, where we dealt with last week, that the heart, the steadfast mind that, say, that stays true to the course of honoring Jesus Christ and reaching for the prize of the high calling of Christ Jesus. Today we're getting to what I just call a secure mind. And this part of Philippians, he deals with a very important issue, all right, about it really just kind of wraps up much of what he said in the letter already about uh, living in that life that's extraordinary, that brings about rejoicing in your life. At one point he says, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Again, remember you're talking about a guy who's, who's in prison, all right, and chained to a prison guard. So as we look at this today, starting in chapter 4, as we continue our study in, in uh, of, uh, the extraordinary living of the book of Philippians. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown... So stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. And I urge Yodia and I urge Sinchus to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true comrade, I ask you also to help these women who shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Let me just pause there. This isn't the heartbeat of the message this morning. I do want to bring out this one thing. Of everything that Paul has written to Philippians, this is really the big first issue of any internal conflict within this church at Philippi. It's this struggle between these two women. It doesn't get into any detail of what their, their issues were. It doesn't take sides with one side or the other. Obviously, there was a problem between these two women. He says, urge them to live in harmony together in the Lord. In other words, these women, they were well known in the church. Obviously, they were helpers in the ministry. They were part of the leadership, the teams of ministries that were happening within the fellowship. And now there's this disharmony, this disunity between them. Let me say, as long as you're going to live with other believers and serve the Lord together in the kingdom of God, there's going to be differences of opinion. There's going to be conflicts that arise and circumstances where you have a different mindset than what the other person has. And the issue here, he says, urge them to live in harmony together. Yes. All right. There can be differences of opinion and we can still have harmony. Unity does not mean the absence of difference of opinion. All right. We all have different ideas. You know, is there anybody in this room, just take a brief look around the room today, that you can say honestly of them, that person and I see eye to eye on everything. At this point, it's always fun to watch some of the men put their arms around their wives. And... I'm not buying it. <laughs> no, it's just not possible. But we can live in harmony together and we can have unity. You know, the, the thing that binds us together is the truth of God's word. He didn't say... Get with you, get with you, Odia, and get with Sintish and find out what the beef is and get her side and get his side and let's get it all straightened out. Folks, your side and Odia's side or Sintish's side, it's not the issue. The issue is the kingdom of God and will Christ be glorified in our behavior and our attitude and our actions with each other. Too often people go around the fellowship and they want to tell their side or their story or what they heard. Knock it off. 
What we're here for is restoration. We're about reconciliation. We're about praying for the glory of God to be done in everybody's life. That's the number one goal. So that sermon was free. Let's move on to verse four. <laughs> Rejoice in the Lord. What's that next word? Always. I thought that's what you said. And again, I will say, Rejoice. Let your gentle, forbearing spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brother, remember he said that once before, by the way. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, what is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is ever of, a, of good repute, if there's any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace shall be with you. Now, as we've talked about the single mind, this being single-minded and having a submissive mind and steadfast mind, what we're gonna look at today is having a secure mind. In the midst of problems, in the midst of issues, and certainly if anybody had issues for anxiety, it was the Apostle Paul, but he's kind of giving this clear word, hey, don't be anxious for anything. But here's a guy who should be anxious about everything in, in our book. I mean, he's got the problems with all different issues going on in all the churches that he's established. Worrying about those things, anxiety over that, anxiety over the church at Philippi, everything's been going so good, and now you got these two women in leadership having issues with each other. And then he's, you know, he's living in prison. He can't go do anything about it. He can't go, you know, like, like men want to do, want to go fix it real quick. He can't go fix anything. So, you know, you think he'd be worried about that. He's facing possibly a death sentence. So, I mean, he's got a lot that he could be anxious about, does he not? He's got a lot of things that are going on in his life. As do we all. We all have things that just kind of plague us at times, it seems like, and issues that are, that are pressing before us. And it seems that, you know, there's stress and there's worries and there are anxieties on every side. And here the apostle gets into the mix of things and he says, hey, don't worry about it. Now, he doesn't say, don't worry, be happy. <laughs> he does say, don't worry, pray about everything. And this is, the, this is what he wants to get across in this part of the letter. You know, is the, 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 and it's really, I think, a, a major critical issue in our lives because we're living in a stress-filled, worry-filled, anxiety-filled culture. People have anxiety attacks and worry fears. And, and, and maybe you don't have to get into those situations where it's crippling you, but it certainly does in so many other ways seem to cripple us. In fact, the Greek word in regard to worry, the Greek word here for anxious, is, 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 it's translated in some Bibles as careful, but the idea is to be pulled in a lot of different directions at one time. That's the idea. I've got to go pull this way. I'm pulled that way. I'm pulled that way. I'm pulled this way. I think this is right. Well, maybe that's not. And all these different things that come against our life or going on in our life. There's a million things we could set back and say, I've just got a lot to worry about. You may have a lot to worry about, but scripture makes this clear injunction. Don't worry about anything. In fact, the old English word, which we get, which is the root word for our word worry is a word which means to strangle. And in fact, that's, I don't know about you, but times I've felt strangled by different issues that I might be having to deal with or go through or put up with perhaps that just seem to not only pull you and tear you apart, but they also seem to have a, a strangling effect on your life. And there's a lot of people living there and a lot of people are living as Christians in this way. And here's, here's an interesting word from God that tells us, hey, don't worry about it. In fact, so many people worry that they're experiencing all kinds of difficulties. We know there's definite physical consequences that come from worry, from headaches to neck pains to tooth problems, back pains, ulcers. Anxiety sets in on us when we let it take over our lives. Worry affects our thinking. It affects the direction of our life. It causes problems with indigestion. Some doctors say even problems with imbalance, being able to properly balance yourself when you're filled with anxieties and when you're filled from worries. But let's look at this little topic today just briefly on this regarding worry and what does the Bible have to say about it from a spiritual point of view we just kind of put in a nutshell here worry is wrong thinking dealing with our mind and wrong feeling dealing with our heart wrong thinking wrong feeling about what circumstances people 
situations, things that are going on in our life. We're not thinking about it right. We're not feeling about it right. And the result of all those things that go on, extracurricular stuff that goes on in our life, we're filled with anxiety. What a, what a great thief of our joy. This book just, pre, uh, just emanates so much with what it means to have joy in the Lord and rejoice in the Lord. And he's, he's saying, rejoice, Lord, always. Rejoice, Lord, always. And don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. But pray about everything. See, because it deals with the heart and mind. Worry's an inside job. It begins to affect the way I'm thinking about you or others, the situation that's going on. And, and it really takes more than just having good intentions not to worry because anybody can say, don't worry, be happy. Well, that's nice, but I'm still worrying. <laughs> Even after I preach this message today and, and I'm trying to get across the point, don't worry but about anything, he says, but pray about everything. As I'm shaking hands with some folks leaving the service this morning, one lady says to me, that was such a great sermon. I'm really going to try not to worry about anything. I said, ma'am, you missed it. I didn't say that. I said, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. But that's where most people are caught in that trap. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to worry about it. Oh, I'm worried about it. But I'm not going to worry about it. And you're worried about not worrying about it. <laughs> And you just add more worry to your worry, all right? Till you're just worn out with worry. And the apostle, boy, again, if, he had any, if anybody in the world had anything to worry about, here's a guy who's got everything pressing in on him from every different side. The antidote to worry, we've talked about what kind of mind to have, is you look at scripture, the antidote to worry is a secure mind. Where in the world do I get a secure mind? Well, he tells us in verse seven, and the peace of God, Amplified puts it this way, shall keep Garrison, guard like a soldier, your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. How do I deal with it? Well, he's saying here, there's this little thing called the peace of God that brings security to the mind and guards it on every side. And it, 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 I love the way scripture puts it because when you have this secure mind, it says in verse seven, the peace of God will guard you. Verse 9, he talks about how the peace of God will guide you. So it not only acts as a guard, standing watch over your mind to keep you secure, the peace of God will, but he also said the same peace of God will guide you. I mean, what kind of protection do you need? This is better than Brinks, all right? This is better than any security service. This is better than the most elite forces of the world when God is guarding you with his peace. He said, well, if that's what it takes. That's what I want. Where do you get to that? How do you get that to that place in your life where you can come to a, a sense of peace in your own heart? God's taking care of it. Well, I'm so glad you asked because that's what we want to talk about. In the context of, and this is what he writes to us about. If you want to conquer the worry, experience the secure mind, there's three conditions, three elements, principles that he talks about in this passage. Verses six through seven, he talks about prayer, right praying. In verse eight, he talks about how we think and what we think on. So he talks about right thinking. In verse nine, he talks about how we live our lives, right living. And if we put those three together with praying and thinking, living right and righteously, he said, man, the God of peace is standing guard at the door of your heart and your mind. And he will guard you and he will guide you. So let's just look at those individually. First of all, in regard to right praying. All right. Now, Paul doesn't start his letter and say, hey, there's lots of problems out there. Pray about it. In fact, it's, it's kind of like he's building in this letter, this principle where he gets to say at the end of the letter. And by the way, don't worry. It, it, and that, I love this is the way scripture is given to us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's one block upon another block. There's a foundation that's built and we, we stand on that block. We, he takes us to another level and we keep building upon a secure base. He says, listen, the, the first element to this is, 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 is prayer, adoration, worship, supplication, thanksgiving. In fact, he uses those three words. Prayer is the general idea we talk of, we use to talk in reference to about talking to God or making our requests known to God. But understand with prayer, it carries more than just the idea Well, I'm going to run into a prayer closet or get off to the side and give God my little list. No, he's talking about this context of prayer in, in the form of adoration. Prayer is worship. Prayer is entering into his presence with adoration. What happens? And this is such an important part of this anxiety issue. If you're facing them today. 
What happens when you start praying about things, when you really get with God on these issues and you first of all enter into his presence with adoration and with genuine worship, all of a sudden you begin to sense the greatness of God. You begin to see just how glorious he is, just how big he is, just how sovereign he is. So when I enter in and I start looking at the glorious person of God and who he is and begin to see how he's almighty, he's creator of all things, he's the faithful judge over all things. And we begin to experience in this place of prayer the awesomeness and the sovereignty of God. Man, I, it does begin to affect our, our heart. It begins to affect our mind. It begins to affect the way we begin to perceive and to see our situations. Now I'm seeing this big God. All I saw before was a big problem. But now this big problem is brought into a whole new light. It's the light of God and the light of God's word. And all of a sudden I see that what I thought was so insurmountable and so impossible and so difficult, how in the world am I ever gonna live with this? I see now I see God in the scene. I see a big God in the scene. So the, the first step here is I'm getting with God and it's just this aspect of adoration, this aspect of, of praise, this aspect of, of worshiping God. So when worry comes, anxiety begins to fill my heart. My first step, my first action, your first action needs to be get alone with God. Get with God. I got a situation. I've got to take this to God. And first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to worship him. And just deep reverence. That's right praying. It's not just running in with a list. This is adoration. And the second part of that is supplication. Now supplication, as simple as I can define it, would be just earnestly sharing our needs and problems. And I use the word earnestly as earnestly as I can. It has to do with a passion of your heart. It has to do with concern. There's no place at this point for half-hearted prayer. There's no place here for just shooting up a little few words we, we know how to pray and kind of soothe ourselves. Jesus said, your father doesn't hear your prayer on the basis of your much speaking. It's not about saying a lot of words. He looks to the heart. We realize that our father wants us to be earnest in our asking. This is the way Jesus prayed. And, and I think that the extreme best picture you can find is Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, supplication earnest prayer. I mean, the disciples are sleeping. Jesus is sweating great drop, drops of blood. He is bringing the whole issue to the Lord. There's something about when we really get serious with God about the issue we're facing, something we're having to deal with. It may be our own crucifixion, perhaps we think, but we earnestly bring it to the Lord. Supplication. It's not a matter of carnal energy. It, it's a matter of, of spiritual intensity. All right that I'm really, I am committed to get this thing before God. So with adoration, supplication, and obviously I think this is the, 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 the step of faith in the whole prayer issue is thanksgiving. Give thanks to God. Give thanks, remember when Jesus healed the 10 lepers? Only one of the 10 returned to give thanks. I doubt that that percentage is any higher today. Would you? And I've been guilty of being one of those nine lepers too. We are eager many times to ask, but slow to appreciate. Now, even as we get into Thanksgiving season, it might be a good reminder. Say, I'm gonna to take today and not ask God for anything. I'm just gonna start thanking him for everything. <laughs> he knows now, I'm just gonna spend the day thanking him for what he's done. And just with a heart of earnest thanksgiving and appreciation to God, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, you're going to note here that as we say this thing is built upon block upon block, that right praying we're talking about here is not something that every Christian can do immediately. Say, so what do you mean? Because right praying really depends upon a, a, a knowledge of Scripture. I think it depends upon uh, the right kind of mind, which comes from the knowledge of Scripture. So once our heart and life and mind get right, then our prayers can start being right. That's why I believe the formula for peace that Paul gives here is not found in chapter one. It's found here on four because he's building up to it where he talks about first, you know, if we have a single mind of Philippians one, you know, that single mind is, guess what? That, that, that means we don't really know how to worship God and praise God. So, I mean, how can a double minded person ever really praise God? They don't really ever praise God. They're too busy with other things. Then, then that submissive mind of Philippians two that we talked about, 
Now we can come with supplication, with genuine humility before the Lord, because a proud person, you know, with a proud mind is really not going to ask God for anything that's related to the will of God. They're only concerned about what they want. So he deals with this issue of selflessness in chapter two. In chapter three, you know, that spiritual mind, the mind that's set on the things of God, the steadfast mind, I want to be like Christ. I want to live as Christ and to reach the goal of the prize, the high calling in Christ Jesus. Hey, a worldly minded person, they wouldn't know that God had given them anything to appreciate. Much less had given it to them to start with. And there's no appreciation there. In other words, if I want to have the right praying, I really need to get serious about Philippians chapter one, chapter two, chapter three in my life. Single-minded, submissive-minded, steadfast-minded. That leads to this secure mind that he talks, talks to us about. So here's the counsel that he gives. He said, don't worry about anything, but I, what I want you to do is take everything to God in prayer. That's the admonition. The result, he says, and the peace of God will keep your hearts and minds. Brother Joe, I want the peace of God because I am torn apart by anxiety. I'm torn apart by my fears. I have doubts. There's all this stuff going on in my life, all these pressures and all these worries. Even like I'm worried about everything. Then here's where it starts. Get your, get your heart set on things above. Get your mind set on things above. S learn how to surrender your will to God's will. Learn how to be a, a servant for the Lord's glory and for his grace. Learn what your gifts and callings are. Make yourself available to God and begin to give everything to him in prayer. You know, we're prone in our culture as Christians today. We'll, we'll pray about the big things and we leave the little things, you know, alone. But he says, don't worry about anything, but do what? Pray about what? Pray about what? Pray about what? Are you sure? Pray about what? Does that mean everything? Absolutely everything. Pray about everything. Well, I can handle this. No, you can't. Last time you handled it, you remember what happened? Come on. So I'm gonna need, I need to pray about big stuff, medium stuff, little stuff, minor stuff, major stuff. Pray about everything. Talking to God about everything that concerns your life. Every step you should be taking. That's the first step towards victory over worry. Right praying. And with right praying, he said, the result of that will be the peace of God. You know, the peace of God will keep your heart and mind, which leads us to this peace of God doing what? It's keeping our heart and our mind. Remember, Paul is chained to a Roman guard. All right, all the, he's guarded day and night. So we understand what he's talking about, a guard here. <laughs> I'm being guarded day and night. But I'm also being guarded by more than a Roman soldier. The peace of God is guarding my heart and my mind. It stands guard over two areas, literally. The two areas where our worries come from, our heart and our mind, our wrong feelings, our wrong thinkings. God's saying he'll stand guard over that. I love the way, again, the way scripture's built. In, in Romans chapter five, it says, by faith in Jesus Christ, it says, we have peace with God. That's good to know, isn't it? That there's no more wall between me and God. There's no more separation that the animosity, rejection of my life because of sin and unbelief and disobedience, that's all been dealt with because Jesus died to pay for all my sins. I have peace with God. I'm not afraid to die. Why? I have peace with God. I'm not afraid of tomorrow. Why? I have peace with, I have peace with God. But not just peace with God. As you follow the scriptures, it talks about the peace of God. I have peace of God, all right? For right here now, the peace of God I have peace with God, gives me peace of God, and that, that takes me a step further into everything God has for me. It doesn't mean I'm not gonna have problems. It doesn't mean the issues, the trials, and the, and, the, and, and, and the stress of the day is not going to be there, but now there's a way in which I deal with this. Boy, Daniel's a great illustration of this right praying, and this, this, right, this right thinking. You remember the edict comes down in Daniel chapter six that uh, you, nobody can pray to their God. They can only pray to the king. That's all you can pray for. Well, this is where it comes down to God and government, which we're going to face more and more in the days that are ahead of us. And Daniel says, you know, well, I worship God, not the government. So I don't care what the government says. I'll do what the government says until it contradicts what God says. And here's a point where it contradicts what God says. So I'm not going with government on this one. I'm going with God on it. And it says in Daniel chapter six, that Daniel did as he always did. He went to his room, opened his window, and in verses one through 10, it says he prayed before his God. In verse 10, it says, and he prayed and he gave thanks. Well, he ought to, he's facing some troubles here, right? Anxieties come, trials are upon him. The threat of death is now imminent, it's a real deal. So what's he do? 
He does, as he's always done, as he's prone to do, he seeks the face of God. What are you going to do with your worries? What are you going to do with the anxieties? It says in Daniel 6, 10, and he prayed. Verse 11, it says, and he made supplication and he gave thanks. And the result of right praying here, the result of the right praying was right in the midst of all the problems and all the difficulty, victory reigned supreme. Daniel went to sleep that night in a lion's den. They threw him into prison and they threw him in prison with lions. They don't make the best cellmates, <laughs> right? But Daniel had no problem sleeping. The king, however, didn't sleep a wink that night. Daniel slept like a spank baby. He's fluffing up lion's manes maybe, you know, I'm making pillows, I don't know. But he slept comfortably, he slept. Hey, listen, the first condition of having a secure mind like that and victory over worry is you start praying, which leads you now to this right thinking in Philippians 4, 8, where he says, you know, and the God of peace shall, shall keep your heart and mind. Because really, peace involves two things. It involves the heart and the mind, does it not? Because this is where the battle is in the mind, right? This is where the thoughts come, where the worries come. Isaiah 26 says, thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because thou trustest. He trusteth in thee. Now, I don't know about you, but if you really want a good passage of scripture to memorize right on your heart, put in your mind, this is certainly one of the top ones. I memorized this scripture shortly after I got saved. It has been a life saving verse on many nights in my life. Through many problems, through many adversities, through many worries, through a lot of anxieties, this always has been the anchor scripture that I have gone back to in my life. That God will keep me, Joe Arms, in perfect peace when my mind is stayed on him. Why? Because the mind has a tendency to get stayed everywhere else. To focus on it. Because this is the way Satan works, does he not? He comes and what's he? He tells a lie. He comes and tries to affect the way you think, the, 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 what you're looking at. And he says, listen, you know, you keep your mind on him. Why? Because if I don't, my mind in the wrong place leads to the wrong place. It leads to wrong thinkings. It leads to wrong feelings. And before long, the heart and the mind are pulled apart and I'm strangled by everything that's going on in my life. That's why the apostle Paul made it clear in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, that we bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ Jesus, the Lord. It's not just saying, I don't want to think that, I don't want to think that, because in doing that, you get caught in the trouble, all you're doing is thinking about it. But it's saying, I'm taking that thought and I'm gonna enjoy my secure mind by giving this thought to the Lord Jesus Christ and submitting it to him. I choose your will over this, Father. I, I don't remember, I, I read this little poem. It's been popular in Christian circles for decades. It says, sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. The destiny, Starts with the thought. And some of you wonder why you keep ending up in the wrong place is because the wrong thoughts. They're not, they're not of God. In fact, he gets into a detail and tells us exactly how we ought to think. He says, well, I don't know what to think. Well, he tells us pretty clearly, you know, you know he, he spells out just how we as Christians ought to be thinking in, in regard to things. He says, first of all, whatever is true. That cuts out a lot of stuff, doesn't it? because Satan's attack on our mind is always based upon a lie. He's a liar, the father of lies. Every temptation begins with a lie. It says, hey, you can be happy if you do this. You can be satisfied if you do this. You'll like this, you'll enjoy this. And this is gonna bring you fullness, and it doesn't. We believe a lie. So what do we believe instead of the lie? We believe what's true. Again, this gets back to what Pastor Joe is constantly on your case about. Get in the word of God. How are you gonna know what's true if you don't read the Bible? You saturate your heart and your mind with the Word of God. I read an interesting article, a survey by Dr. Walter Cavert. He did a survey on worry. He said that only 8%, catch this, 8% of the things people worried about were really legitimate concerns. I mean, take all the worries you have. I got 100 of them. Take eight of them out there. They're about the only legitimate ones. The other 92%, he said, were either imaginary never happened or involved matters in which that person had no control over in any way. And that's the way we do. We were about all things we can't do anything about anyway. What if they do this? What if they say that? What if this happens? Or what if I lose my job? Or what about that? What if, what, what if I can't get a job? What if, and on and on. And we just fill our hearts and minds with worries and, and, and Satan's just loving it. Hath God said. <laughs> And here we end up. Well, what, what happens is when we realize that, hey, if I'm gonna think about what's true, 
That's the word of God. And what does God say? That's why it's important to memorize scriptures like I just shared with you, that he'll keep your heart and mind. That, you know, that if, if your mind is stayed on him, he'll give you peace. It's important to memorize those things because God operates in our lives by the means of the word of God. His Holy Spirit will take the word of God that's in your heart and in your mind and he'll give a light and he'll give direction. And so now I'll choose to believe, believe the light and the direction and not the lie. But if the light and the direction is not there, then I am easily susceptible to the lie. Am I not? That's why it's important to fill my heart and life. Jesus said, the words that I speak to you, they are true. Everything Satan tells you, he says, is a lie. And whenever I choose to believe a lie, then anxiety takes over and fear takes over, doubt takes over, worry takes over. So I think about what's true. The second thing is they do this. I want you to think about the things that are, are honest and just. I put these together because basically it's worthy of respect and right. What's worthy of respect and right. There, there, there are a lot of things that come in our mind that are not respectable. And they're not worthy of, of, of thinking about. And the Bible says, don't think about those things. Now, it doesn't mean I just stick my head in the sand and, and avoid whatever's unpleasant in life and displeasing in life. But it does mean when that comes in before me, into my heart, into my mind, or into my eyesight, I'm not going to focus my attention there. I'm not going to camp right there and start building a little house out there. It's what the Bible calls strongholds. Strongholds are simply thoughts that you have built up, fortifications in your own mind, which are contrary to the mind of Christ and contrary to the will of God and just little fortresses that are there. And you believe them. You say, well, that's just the way I am or that's, I've always been that way or that's just my family or that's, a, that's my personality. Those are strongholds because in Christ you're a new creation. So all those things don't have to manipulate your life. You choose to. So he said, you know, if it's not worth the respect and it's not right, don't permit it. Then he used this word, whatever is pure and lovely and good report. Now this probably refers, obviously, the first part of this to morality. Because so many times, most of people's fears, anxieties, and worries stem from attacks by the enemy towards sexual impurity. And Satan loves to draw us away into that. He says, listen, the first, the first step there is not to hold on to the thoughts. When that temptation comes, it's time to dismiss it. When that temptation comes, it's time to think about what's pure, not what's impure. What's pure? And then I begin to dwell on the things that appear and the things not. He says, lovely. And that's the word for beautiful. <laughs> it's the word for attractive. There's nothing more beautiful than my Lord, obviously. You know, nothing more attractive than his work in my life and the Holy Spirit of God. Nothing more beautiful than his word. He says, whatever's of a good report. I mean, he's saying, hey, if you're going to think about something, make sure it's something worth talking about in a righteous way. <laughs> that you, it will bring about a good report. It's not a bad report. We read from Numbers about the children of Israel when they spied out the land, how that out of the 12, 10 came back with an evil report is what the scripture talked about. And that evil report of negativity influenced the whole nation of Israel to go the other direction. We don't want to live by a, a bad report. A righteous report. And then he says, whatever possesses virtue and praise. If it has virtue, if that's what I'm thinking about, guess what's going to happen? It's going to begin to motivate me to a higher place and to a, to a better place in my life. If it has praise, if it has virtue, it's going to move me forward. If it has praise, it's going to be commendable to other people. I'll be talking about it. I'll be rejoicing in it. I'll be sharing it with other people. You know, what was those... Saying on TV, the mind's a terrible thing to waste, you know. I'll put it this way. God says the mind's a beautiful thing to waste. And a lot of people waste their mind. Wasted it thinking about, entertaining all the wrong things. Focusing on all the wrong things. Filling it with all the wrong things. And what happens? It's wasted. It's a terrible waste. God gave you this beautiful, glorious, incredible organ in your body called the brain. And it's incredible, especially the potential for your life is incredible. When God begins to fill that mind with his Holy Spirit and begins to do this work of regeneration in your heart and your mind. And when the Christian lets God fill his heart and lets him fill his mind with God's word and God's will, guess what? God does something supernatural in you that brings peace. And guards, and it really does. When you fill your mind with the word of God and the will of God and your heart is bent towards God, guess what happens? It's like there's a radar set up. Nothing can come under it. That it, it detects everything. 
There's this Holy Ghost radar that comes as a result of this in your life. And so that when something comes to your life that's going to cause you to make a bad decision, if you go that way, or it make a bad move or say a bad thing or do the wrong thing, man, that radar is bleeping. There's something on the screen. Pay attention. Incoming. <laughs> At that point, we recognize it, we renounce it, we deal with it, and we set our mind on different things. Right praying, right thinking, and the peace of God guards us this kind of way. It, it takes over, it protects us. Uh, it, it's the power of the Word of God. Psalms 119.65, here's what the, David said. Great peace have they which love thy word or love thy law. Great peace, not just a little occasional peace. Great peace have those who love your law. Because why? Well, they put it another way, that word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin. It's that radar. It's that sword. It's that answer. So right praying, right thinking, which obviously leads us to right living. You cannot separate this point where of outward action in regard to inward attitude. Genuine inward attitude always expresses itself. Whatever your attitude is inwardly is what's coming out. Whatever your mind is, and we keep seeing this over and over, but the mind, the mind of Christ, the guarded mind, the settled mind, the mind set on things above. All this is through the Philippians. It, 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 the mind that is set on things above, guess what? Then the life is going to be manifestly set in such a way that you're going the right direction. Another passage in Isaiah 32 says this, verse 17, and the work of righteousness shall be peace. The work of righteousness shall be peace. My walk with God brings about peace. That's the work that righteousness does in me as a saint of God and in you as a saint of God as we're seeking him and seeking to live righteously before him. It brings peace. You know what the rest of that verse says in verse 17? That the work of righteousness shall be peace and the effect of righteousness, quietness and peace. Powerful words. James put it this way. The wisdom that is from above is first peaceable. But how, how does that reality work in my life? Well, right living is necessary. There's so many people who just say, well, I'm saved, I'm a Christian, we go live however they want. And they, then they throw out the door, I'm under grace. They have no concept of what grace is. The Bible says the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness. Start right there. Lesson one. <laughs> grace, God's emanates in our heart and our life that God gives us his power to, to walk and to live and to live out what he's done in our life so we're not living as hypocrites. People say, well, God wants just impossible. That's the beauty of it. But by the power of the Holy Spirit working, it becomes a possibility. And look at the way he balances this, this whole thing out. He, he says, listen, it's part, these four things in verse nine says, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, do that. Don't you love that? What you've learned and received and heard and seen. By the way, Listen carefully. You're just about done here. It's possible to learn something this morning and not receive it. Are you with me? Yes. We've learned a lot of stuff, but I don't know how much we've received. Which is the danger a lot of times in a church like this. We have a lot of teachers, a lot of good Bible preachers, and a lot of the words going out constantly. All right? And the people who love the Word of God. We have a tendency to get a lot in here, but not a whole lot down here. It has to go from information to transformation. And this is the point he's making here. Don't just hear it, receive it. The Bible says receive with meekness the engrafted word, all right? There's this point where you say, I will choose to accept that. I choose to believe that. I want to receive it inwardly, make it part of my inner person and my inner man. Facts in the head are not enough. There has to be truth implanted in the heart. This is what Paul's saying, don't just hear it, receive it. Then James said, don't just be, here's the word, be doers of the word. It's, a, it's the same context here. And he said, hey, not only am I going to teach the word, I'm going to preach the word. Not only am I going to speak the word like we do, we're going to live the word of God. We want people to see truth in our lives. Not just to hear truth from my words. They need to see it worked out in their life. They need to see us in the, in the fire. They need to see us in the lion's den. They need to see us in the stresses and the pressures and the complexities of our life. Still living for Jesus Christ and still rejoicing in the Lord. Let me wrap it up with just a couple of thoughts here. One is this, the peace of God gets down really to being the test of whether or not we're in the will of God. The Bible says, let the peace of, that Christ gives, the peace of the Lord Jesus, you know, act as a ruler in your heart. William's translation says, is the umpire in your heart. If I'm walking with God, 
and the peace of God is guarding my heart and mind, then it's supposed to influence my decisions. That's what he's saying here. There's a decision to make. Let the peace of God tell you which way to go. So that when I'm, when I'm praying right, my thinking's right, and I'm living right, talk about that radar system, that if something comes to my life that I shouldn't watch, I shouldn't go, I shouldn't do, the Holy Spirit's telling me that. So if I start to move in that direction, what happens? There's, there's this, this is unsettledness. I don't have peace about it. There's, this, there's, there's something that's wrong, and I may not even understand why. I mean, little kids always want to know why, 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 why. Well, it's nice when you know the answer why, but sometimes you don't know the answer why. You just need to do it. He's your father. All right? He's, he's got his best in mind for you. He's not trying to ruin your life, mess you up, or lead you wrong. So in faith, I'll trust the peace that he's given me. This, that we've talked about the idiot light and the dashboard. If it goes off, I need to do something. So I, I'm going to seek God's face. So I need to let God lead me by the peace. The word umpire, when you watch the Texans today, there'll be a bunch of referees in the game. They're going to tell you if it's inbounds, out of bounds, received or not received, fumbled or not fumbled or whatever it was. And the final decision of the referee is what stands. All right. They may have to go through an instant replay or whatever, but the final decision of the referee stands. The final decision of God, your father stands. Now you can argue with the umpire. You can throw your baseball hat like they do in baseball on the ground, stomp your feet, kick the dust, do all those things those coaches do. But if he says you're out, you're out. If he says you're safe, you're safe. If he says it's foul, it's foul. If he says it's in, it's in. If it's fair, it's fair. If not, Allow the peace of God to rule in your heart. Even if we disobey God, you're going to obviously know it because you lose your peace with God. Not you have peace with God, but you lose the peace of God in your life at that moment. So you listen. Wrap it up with right praying, right thinking, right living. These are the conditions that are set forth if you want to have a secure mind. It's not plagued constantly, beat up, strangled and torn apart from every direction. Philippians chapter four is called the peace chapter of scriptures. But there's another chapter in scripture called the war chapter. Anybody know what that is? It's James chapter four when James says, where are your fighting come from? And this deals on a global level or just you and your house. <laughs> where, do your, where do your quarrels come from? Where do your quarrels come from? What's the parallel here? When James starts saying, where does your war come from? Just as Paul answers the question in Philippians about where's your peace come from? By right praying, by right thinking, by right living. He says, when do the wars come among you? James says, well, your problem is you, you don't pray right. <laughs> you see, you don't pray right. So you've got conflict, you don't have peace. You've got wars, you don't have peace. You've got strife and stress and worry and anxiety. You had each other's throat. You ask, you receive not because you ask amiss. Wrong thinking. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. <laughs> Where's the war going? You're double-minded. You make your mind, find out what God's mind is. That's where security is. That's where peace is. And he said, wrong living. He said, friendship with the world is enmity with God. God's your friend. God's your lover. God's your, 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 your mate. He's the one you're faithful to. He's your God. Not this world. Because wrong praying, wrong thinking, wrong living only end up in war. Conflict. Where does peace come from? Right praying, right thinking. A mind's filled with the word of God. That expresses itself in right living. That's, where, that's when you experience the peace of God. So get the whole lesson today. One, worry about what? Worry about what? Let's say it together. Worry about nothing. Second part, pray about everything. One more time, pray about everything. You mean everything? Everything. The Greek word there means everything. <laughs> the Hebrew word there means everything. The English word means everything. That's when you begin to experience genuine peace from God. And you're not rolling and tossing and turning in bed at night, dealing with ulcers, trying to buy extra medication for every little fear you got. And there's a, there's a prescription for about every anxiety you hold. You know, that's what's made the pharmaceutical world rich. Antidepressants, anti-anxieties, you know, and on and on and on the list goes. 
Would you stand with your head bowed this morning? I will not be giving an invitation.